Hey friends, welcome to Unpacking the Mass. Today we're looking at the readings for the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. And there's just a theme throughout this text that has been really hitting me personally as I've been studying these words. And the theme is basically this, the key to love is humility. Think about that for a second. You might think the key to love is in being able to serve or being able to be um, a, a help to others in some other way, a feeling perhaps, and all those things are, are a part of it. But what the scripture is going to teach us today is that the ultimate key, none of those things can be unlocked without the key, which is humility, my friends. And we're going we're gonna to walk through this in a pretty awesome way. I'm very excited about, my, about it, my friends, because we all want to know what it looks like to be loved, don't we? But in order to be loved, we have to know what it looks like to actually love. And without humility, we can't truly love. And it's amazing to me how this gets lost in our culture so many times, because we think that love is about how we feel, which in, in turn is going to be related to what we get out of a situation. But that's really backwards and wrong. True love is being able to give of yourself completely. And you can't truly give of yourself completely if you have all these expectations about what you want to get in return. And that's what we're going to look at today. All right, we're going to start with the book of Sirach, chapter 3, for our first reading. And it reads this way. My child, conduct your affairs with humility, and you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. Humble yourself the more, the greater you are, and you will find favor with God. What is too sublime for you, seek not. Into things beyond your strength, search not. The mind of a sage appreciates proverbs, and an attentive ear is the joy of the wise. Water quenches a flaming fire, and alms atone for sins. We, we really need to give this a thought, my friends, because we think that lots of times oh, we deserve love based on what we do for other people, which which flips around to when we do things for other people, we think we deserve things in return. And humility is the antidote of that. Have you ever loved somebody or served somebody and then you felt hurt or upset that they didn't return that favor to you? I mean, that's really a common experience of life, isn't it, my friends? I mean, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll look towards those who we want something from or friendship with, and we'll try to like work our way into that by serving them or offering them something or giving them something. And then we expect that that's going to lead to a return. And if it does, hey, that's great. But what if it doesn't? What if the people that you reach out to in your desire to be loved by them is, what if they don't reach back out to you? How does that make you feel? And if the answer is, it makes me feel upset, it makes me feel angry, it makes me feel taken advantage of, then you have to ask yourself this question, was I reaching out to them because I truly loved them and wanted to serve them, or was I secretly hoping for something in return? And it's okay if you want something in return and you want to, like, that's fine, but keep in mind that that's different from reaching out to them in love. And it doesn't make it necessarily bad. So let's say, for example, you have a business that you're running. And uh, this used to happen to us all the time in photography. So let me give you a couple of examples of how this played itself out. There would be plenty of people, especially when we were first starting out, who would come to us and say, hey, we would love for you to come take pictures at our event or whatever that this let's say a business is trying to promote and we we're not going to pay you of course but we are going to make sure that everybody that's there knows that you donated your time and they in return will you know use you for their photography business or whatever or we as a company maybe we'll go, come to you for our headshots or our paid commercial work that we need from you so we would oftentimes enter into these relationships doing things for free to serve other people, but we had a specific goal in mind. And our goal was, um, you know, that they would patronize our business. And if they didn't, I used to get really ticked off. And I used to think, man, what a ripoff. Why did I work so hard for these people for free? And then they didn't 
want to do that. And what I learned, of course, was in business, but I know this isn't a business course, but what I learned was, was that anybody who was truly reaching out to you and didn't value you enough to pay you wasn't ever really going to uh, patronize your business anyway. So that was just a, a lesson I learned. Now, that's different from other circumstances where Estelle and I saw maybe a family or um, we took a lot of pictures of high school seniors. And there were a few times where we um, saw someone who we just wanted to bless and we knew they couldn't afford to pay us. You know, maybe it was an organization, a charity, a church or whatever, you know, things like that. And, and we wanted to bless them and we didn't expect anything in return. We weren't saying to ourselves, well, we're going to reach out to these guys and offer our services in the hopes that they can pay us or do something for us. No, it was just out of our desire to be blessed. Do you see the difference in those two things? One is sort of this transactional relationship, which I would say doesn't fall under the category of love, whereas the other one is completely about wanting to serve another person or another group without expecting anything in return. And the love of that is its own reward, right? That's what I'm talking about. That's how we need to approach our relationships, my friends, with, with people in, in love, or at least recognize that's what the goal should be. Too often times, we treat other human beings the way that those businesses treated us and we treated the businesses, you know, where, the, where there's all these strings attached. We treat other, other friends like that or people that we want to be their friends. We look at them and say, this person can do something for me and therefore I'm going to serve them in some way. And maybe they didn't even ask for it. You know, it's, it's interesting, but um, that, that happens all the time, doesn't it? You know, have you ever had someone volunteer to do something for you that you didn't really ask for? And they said, oh, I want to do this for you. And, and then when they did, and then you didn't want anything out in return, they were upset. Think about the guys that knock on your door with the vacuum cleaners. And this happened to us too when we were younger. These, these, this husband and wife knocked on our door one day and said, hey, guess what? We, you've won a free room cleaning and we'd love to come and, and shampoo the carpets in your room, in your house for free. And there's no strings attached. We just want to do that for you. Congratulations. And we were stupid enough to go, yeah, sure, come on in. Which, of course, four hours later at the end of this presentation, they wanted us to buy a $1,500 vacuum cleaner. And when we didn't, they were like, but don't look at all the work we just did. We cleaned this room for you. Have you ever experienced that in a friendship where someone has served you, but you quickly learned that there were strings attached? That, that happens. And we have to make sure that we aren't like that, my friends, because true humility it isn't loving someone with expectations of what is going to come to you. Now, I know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not beyond understanding this, that even in our friendships and relationships, they're not supposed to be one-sided, okay? And if, if you find yourself in relationships with people and you're always reaching out to them and they're never reaching out to you, you're always serving them and they're never serving you, then maybe it's just time to reevaluate that relationship or understand that it is what it is. You serving them and loving them without anything in return. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to want to have that give and take in relationships. That's healthy. But what I am saying is that if we initiate something for someone else with all of this expectation that they're going to do something for us, especially if they didn't ask us in the first place, then we're the ones that have to check our hearts, my friends. You see, what God is saying is, is this, the greater you are, humble yourself all the more. And you know, we see a lot of this too in our lives, don't we? Oftentimes people, when they achieve a certain level of status in society or success in their field, they tend to think that other people should serve them all the more. I, I've seen this countless times in ministry where people who have successful ministries start to want to be treated like rock stars and start to want to be given special treatment from other people, and they don't want to do certain things, or they don't think they should have to do certain things or whatever that are just like normal things. And, you know, like carry their own stuff or drive themselves to the airport or whatever it might be, my friends. When I, when I hear things like that, uh, it, just, it just cracks me up because the greater we are in ministry, the more humble we should be the greater we are in life. It doesn't matter whether it's ministry or life, whatever it is, the greater we are, 
the more humble we should be. And it says this, that we will find favor with God. Okay. Keep it simple in your life. What is this? What is too sublime for you? Seek not into the things beyond your strength. Search not. Now he's not saying don't try to expand your knowledge, but what he's saying is this, be okay. Be okay with who you are. Be okay with who you are. And remember that the, the wise person is the one who listens, not the one who's always trying to interject themselves into everybody and everything else. Okay. Kick, kick that around, my friends. I, th- I think there's a lot of truth here in this. And there's a ton of more stuff we're going to get into in this. And then we're going to do something at the end of this, unpacking the mass that, you know, something I need to do and something that all of us need to do. Okay. Let's look at our responsorial Psalm, responsorial Psalm from Psalm 68. God, in your goodness, you have made a home for the poor. The just rejoice and exult before God. They are glad and rejoice. Sing to God, chant praise to his name, whose name is the Lord. God, in your goodness, you have made a home for the poor. The father of orphans and the defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God gives a home to the forsaken. He leads forth prisoners to prosperity. God, in your goodness, you have made a home for the poor. A bountiful rain you showered down, O God, upon your inheritance. You restored the land when it languished. Your flock settled in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided it for the needy. God, in your goodness, you have made a home for the poor. Now, what's this all about? This is about understanding that God provides for those who don't provide for him. Now, you might say, that's not fair, Keith. Nobody provides for God. But I think this is a great example of God isn't saying to people, all right, whatever you do for me, I'm going to do for you. So what do you got? God is willing to provide a home for those who have nothing. The father of orphans and defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God cares about those who have nothing to offer him and nothing they can do. And that's really the point of all of this, as we'll see in our gospel reading. The place where God is trying to get each of us to be is the place where we can love others who can do nothing for us because we recognize that love in and of itself is its own reward and is truly revealed when we serve others who really there's no way we can have an ulterior motive because they can't do anything for us. Let's look at our second reading, my friends. It comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Brothers and sisters, you have not approached that which could be touched and a blazing fire and gloomy darkness and storm and a trumpet blast and a voice speaking words such that those who heard begged that no message be further addressed to them. No, you have approached Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and countless angels in festal gathering and the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven and God, the judge of all and the spirits of the just made perfect and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. Now, what in the world is this talking about? Friends, this is calling us back to Exodus chapter 19, when the Israelites came to the mountain of Sinai, and they were like, we don't want to hear from God. The mountain was like, you know, with fire, and it was divided from the people, and they were commanded to wash their clothes and abstain from sexual relations. There was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud and a sound of a trumpet and and smoke and fire and, and all these people, they heard God and they were just like, we're not going up there to Moses. And, you know, God spoke to Israel from Sinai, but basically there was this fearful um, separation. And I mean, even Moses said in Deuteronomy 9, I am exceedingly fearful. And what happened? As a result of all of that fear, they didn't understand God's love. They just were like terrified. So what did they do? They worshiped a golden calf and said that it was this golden calf that was the was the God that delivered them from slavery. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is, no, your new covenant is different. It's a covenant built in love that you're approaching a living God who cares for you, who has made a new covenant for you. God, this is the point. God has shown you what it means to be loved by him because he offers himself for you. He's not saying to you, what are you going to do for me? And then I'll decide what I'm going to do for you. No, my friends, 
He's mediated this new covenant with his own blood. And there's nothing you and I can do to earn that or merit that, my friends, apart from his grace. He gives that to us. That's the picture of love. What did Jesus say? Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That's humility. That's the picture of humility. When we're considering what it looks like for us to humble ourselves in our relationships and in our faith, we have to model what Christ did. He laid his life down. We don't try to to intimidate people with fear. Love me or else. Look at everything I've done for you. You don't try to manipulate people and and guilt them and, and try to coerce them into loving you back. Look at all the stuff I've done for you. I've given you this. I've done that. What have you done for me? Let me tell you something. If you get to that point in your relationships, it's pretty hard to come back from that, isn't it? It's pretty hard, especially if that other person hasn't been the one reaching out to you. You know, if, if they've been the one just going through their life and you're all of a sudden just like pouring all this stuff on them, trying to get them to love you, and they're not reciprocating it at all for whatever reason, and then you start to get angry with them, it doesn't work. It was interesting. When I first started doing this stuff on YouTube, I would have, and I still do, but I'd have people reach out to me that I don't know. People like on Facebook would message me and share all this stuff with me. And, and, and I was a guy working two full-time jobs. I didn't have time to, to get into these lengthy conversations with people. But for whatever reason, they decided that you know I needed to know everything about the intimate details of their life. And they needed to be able to talk to me 50,000 times a day. And, and they wanted to have these never-ending chat conversations with me. And I would try to do that because I love people. You know, I, I appreciate hearing from people. And I remember there was this one guy who, um, who he would send me all these messages and they got to be pretty scary to be honest with you. They were a little, they kind of creeped me out. They were, they were about things that he shouldn't have been talking to me about. And he would send me articles and videos and all this stuff. And finally I just got to a point where I just couldn't keep up. Well, then apparently he got like super angry with me and he sent me this scathing message. And it was all about how I, he wishes that somebody would make me feel the way that I make him feel. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? I don't even know you. I've never even seen you. I don't even know you. And how dare I ignore him? And how dare I, you know, blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. And, and I remember I apologized to the guy. And, and, and then eventually it just got to be too much. And then I think he just blocked me or whatever, which, which I was thankful for. You know, here's the thing. I, I wasn't like, reaching out to this guy saying, hey, let's be best friends over Facebook that I don't know you and, and all of this. That was what he was doing to me. And it, it kind of annoyed me. Like it, it was tough, you know, and I, I get lots of messages from people who just want to write in and say, hey, Keith, thank you for what you're doing. We appreciate your stuff. And I, I love that. And I try to, to respond to people when I can and say, thank you so much. But, you know, I'm not able to like always accommodate what everybody thinks I should do in terms of, of, hey, how's your day going? You know, and then have 90 different messages back and forth all day long about everything. So if, if you've done that to me and I haven't been able to respond to you, it's, it's nothing personal. It's just sometimes we can't, we can't do all that. And it's not, it's not just because I'm on YouTube. That happens to people all the time, you know. But here's the deal. I, like, I wasn't asking for that. This guy was pushing that on me. And then when I didn't give it to him, he got super angry with me. And that just revealed to me that, this guy's heart wasn't in the right place in the first place because, you know, he he clearly wanted something that I wasn't able to do. And that, when he wasn't able to get it, he got really, really angry. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing that to other people? And that's that's kind of caused me to, to evaluate how I interact with people because guess what? There are people that I have reached out to other other people in ministry or other people creating stuff or doing whatever that I've reached out to and 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 said, hey, I love what you're doing, blah, 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 this, blah, blah, that, you know, whatever. And I've never heard back from them. And, you know, I, I understand that. And I just kind of go, hey, if at the end of the day, they received that and it blessed them to know that they felt um, like they had helped somebody, me, then that's all I wanted in the first place. But we have to watch ourselves, friends, because it's so easy to, you know, have this anger of, well, what do I get out of this? And that's what, that's what can happen, my friends. But love is different, you see. Love isn't about expectation of a return. 
Love is about the act of giving. We're going to see that in the scripture because if you don't have that, you can, it can be kind of humiliating, you know. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 1 and then 7 through 14. Alleluia, alleluia. Take my yoke upon you, says the Lord, and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Alleluia, alleluia. On a Sabbath, Jesus went to dine at the home of one of the leading Pharisees, and the people there were observing him carefully. He told a parable to those who had been invited, noticing how they were choosing the places of honor at the table. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not recline at table in the place of honor. A more distinguished guest than you may have been invited by him, and the host who invited both of you may approach you and say, give your place to this man. And then you would proceed with embarrassment to take the lowest place. Rather, when you are invited, go and take the lowest place, so that when the host comes to you, he may say, my friend, move up to a higher position. Then you will enjoy the esteem of your companions at the table. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he said to the host who invited him, when you hold a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your wealthy neighbors in case they may invite you back and then you have repayment. Rather, when you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Blessed indeed will you be because of their inability to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteousness. Wow. First of all, this is like, this is so incredible when talking about humility because what Jesus is saying is, is take your place, but let others exalt you, right? Oftentimes we want to be exalted and we want, when we don't feel like that's happening, what do we tend to do? We exalt ourselves and that, that's never good, my friends. Have you ever found yourself tempted to try to tell everybody how great you are and you're always like, oh, I'm super smart. I'm this, I'm that, or here are the things I've done. Or let, me, let me just give you a piece of advice right now. Nobody likes the guy that does that or the girl that does that. If you're always telling everybody about all your accomplishments or about all your achievements, and, and th then what that reveals to people is, A, you have an unhealthy fascination with yourself, and B, nobody else really cares about you that much because otherwise they would do it. Let me give you a great example of this. So I told you guys before about my uh, illustrious high school wrestling career, right? Which, which basically was... Uh, a a three-year career where I probably amassed four or five times the amount of defeats as I had the wins. So I was not very good at wrestling anyway, but I but I did it and, I, and that was that was fine. I had this buddy of mine, all right, G good friend of mine from a different uh, town, and we worked in church camp world together. His name's Doug. Now Doug was an absolute stud. He was a three-time state champion. Okay, amazing guy. But Doug was also one of the most humble guys that I that I have ever met. And I remember Doug was with me um, back in my hometown, and I took him to a grad party for some of my friends. And they were all wrestler dudes. And we were talking to uh, our friend's dad, who didn't know who Doug was, just by, you know, this this guy coming in here. I'm sure he knew his name. But he was talking to Doug, and he, was at, he said, Douglas, uh, you know, so where are you from? Doug's like, oh, I'm from Carlisle, Iowa. You know, he says, oh, well... Um, do you, do you wrestle? And Doug's like, yeah, I, I wrestled. I wrestled there. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, dude, don't you know that this is Doug? Like he's a three-time state champion. And Doug wasn't telling him. Doug was just answering his questions in a humble way. And, and the guy asked Doug, he said, he said, Doug, have you ever qualified for state? And Doug's like, yeah. Um, and I was, and I just finally shut the whole thing down. I'm like, dude, Doug is a three-time state champion. And then the guy was like, oh, you're that guy. Yeah. And, and it just blew my mind. I remember saying, Doug, I'm like, dude, I don't get it. If I was a three-time state champion, I'd probably walk around with my medals on everywhere. I wouldn't let, I would be like, hey, you know, and, and, and it's funny, but he, you know, he just, he never felt the need to tell anybody how great he was. And that always blew my mind, probably because I wasn't, and I always wished that I was, and he was, and he realized that who he was um, and what made him awesome was a lot more to do with his character than the medals that he wore around his neck. He was way more mature and humble than I ever was. That's for sure. 
you know, and, and that just really, I remember after that, it like taught me a lesson. And I remember thinking to myself, the guys who are the best, and this is, is true a lot of times in, in my life that I've noticed, maybe you could relate. Oftentimes the people that are the most secure and the most successful, they do the least amount of bragging about themselves, right? So the lesson I learned is this, you know, don't exalt yourself, let others exalt you. And that's really the message of this parable that Jesus was saying. Because if you try to exalt yourself, you know, like even Doug, three-time state champion, you know, there are guys that are four-time state champions. And if he walked around talking about how great he was all the time and, and, and being obnoxious about it, I'm sure there would be somebody who's like, yeah, well, great. We know how awesome you are, but these other guys, they're better than you. But when you don't do that, then you have the opportunity of being exalted by other people. And the Bible is very clear with us, you know, that the Lord opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And, and what we need to take away from this is we should spend a lot less time trying to tell other people why they should listen to us and respect us and exalting ourselves and just go about our lives doing those things that we think matter and are significant. Now, that's what Jesus is saying at this, at this party, because I'm sure it was a real world example for them, because everybody's clamoring to get to the best seat. And that should never be our mindset in our, in our lives. We should be the ones who, who hang back and take the lowly place, and then maybe somebody will exalt us. But what we don't want to do is ever assume that we should be someplace we're not, and then have to be embarrassed and humiliated. We don't want that, my friends. That's a, that's a, a sure way of making sure that never happens. If you take the lowest spot, then you'll never have to worry about somebody wanting to humili humiliate you. Now, practical reality, you might say, Keith, how do I do that? What does this look like in real life? Well, look at what Jesus said. And Jesus is talking to one of the leading Pharisees, right? You know, one of the leading leaders, right? Um, one of the leading Pharisees of, of, of the time who everybody wants to be in with this guy because he's so awesome. And so he throws these parties and I'm sure it, you know, it's no bruise to his ego to have all these people who are clamoring to get to his house and want to take this, this awesome spot. But Jesus looks at that guy too. He's not just looking at the people who are clamoring for the spot. He's looking at the guy who held the party. And he said, look, here's the deal. When you hold a banquet, you know, if you really want humility and greatness, don't just invite those people who, you know, are going to give you some sort of reward. Maybe in this guy's place it was, oh, they're going to think he's awesome. Or they're going to invite him back, right? That you may have repayment, he says. But rather invite the poor, crippled, lame, blind. Why? Because you will be blessed when you invite those who can't do anything for you. You'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the important thing to remember, my friends. This is how it gets practical. If you really truly want to understand how to express humility, serve those who can do nothing for you, who can give you nothing back. Now, here's the important thing that you have to remember. You might say, well, what does that look like? That's up to you. That's up to you. It doesn't just mean like the homeless guy under the bridge. Okay. Yes. Serve that guy. But people, that can be anybody because that's about your mindset, isn't it? That's about what you bring to that situation and that relationship. The person that you might be called to bless that has no ability to repay you, maybe they have tons of ability to repay you. But what makes that click is your expectation. Because here's the deal. I could be best friends with like a super wealthy, um, you know, guy with tons of influence who could do all kinds of things for me. But if I bless him, without any expectation, without any desire, without any strings, without any attachment, because I love Jesus and because I just want to serve him, then guess what? Even if he's super rich and has all this resources to give me back, he can't pay me back. Why? Because that's not what I'm after. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at here? This isn't just about just go after the, the poor people. Yes, you should do that. And that's good practice because you have to start there because this isn't going to come naturally to you. But ultimately, this is the place we need to get to, my friends. So what Jesus is saying is, look, start with those who literally can't repay you in any way, shape, or form. Bless them 
that will prime your heart and get you into a place where every single relationship, even those who have the ability to bless you back, get to the place where you can love them selflessly too. That's harder, isn't it? It's harder. Because we often look at people and think, man, you know, why haven't they done X for me or Y for me or whatever? They can, but why don't they? Friends, they need to be loved too. You know that? They need to be loved too. And and when we humble ourselves to the place where we can truly reach out to others without expectation, then we've really stepped into the heart of God. We've really recognized what it means to be Christ-like. And then you want to know what's going to happen. This is a beautiful thing. Then when people sense that you are a safe person to receive love from, they will love you. A lot of us don't receive love from other people because we're not safe. What I mean by this is that people understand that you're not a safe person because if they respond to you with love, then, then you're going to overwhelm them or you're going to take advantage of them. Be the kind of person that people know that it's okay to receive what you give them because you're not asking for anything in return. Be safe. And what you'll find is that people will be just drawn to you. People will love you. People will respond to you. The reason oftentimes why they don't is because they're afraid of what's going to happen if they do. And that plays itself out in lots of different ways. You know, my daughter was talking to some guy who was uh, pursuing her, you know, for dating or whatever. And she was over here the other night and this guy texted her and we were having this conversation. I said, well, are you interested in him? She said, no, not at all. And he kept texting her and she's like, I, I know that if I respond to him, because he asked her, what are you doing Tuesday night? And she goes, I know that if I respond to him, then he's going to just be like, all right, I'm coming over. So she was just like, I'm just done with him. And she didn't want to talk to him anymore. Right now, if she knew that she could be honest with this guy and talk to him and that he wasn't going to have expectations to go on a date with him, she probably would have been like, oh, I'm just hanging out. But you see, she knew that he's not a safe guy to receive that, that um, interest from because if she, if she reciprocates it in any little way, boom, now he's going to go, okay, boom, this, 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 that. Now she's in a situation she doesn't want to be in. You understand what I'm saying, my friends? See, we have to learn how to reach out without strings in love. And one of the best ways I've found to make this part of your life is this beautiful prayer called the Litany of Humility, written by Raphael Cardinal Mary de Val Y. Zuleta. That is an awesome name. What does the Y mean? Is that something? I'm on uh, uh, EWTN's website here, and that's who it says the author is. So I thought today we'd close unpacking the Mass with praying this prayer, the Litany of Humility. And this is one that, you know, I pray pretty much weekly, um, but probably should do more of. Maybe you should too as well. So as we close unpacking the Mass, let's join in praying this beautiful Litany of Humility. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, O Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being calumnated, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, Deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, O Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, O Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. 
that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be chosen and I set aside. Grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be praised and I go unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Charity is patient. Charity is kind. Charity does not envy. It is not pretentious. It is not puffed up. It is not ambitious. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice over wickedness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears with all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And one more from Matthew 22, 36 through 40. To have charity is to love God above all things for himself and be ready to renounce all created things rather than offend him by serious sin. Friends, thank you so much for joining me here on Unpacking the Mass. This episode was a little bit longer. Um, hope that was okay with you, but I believe that there's a message in it for all of us. I know there is for me, and I'm so thankful each and every week that we get to walk through these readings together and that God does what he needs to do in our hearts to make us more like him. God bless you, my friends. Take care, and I'll see you next time here on Unpacking the Mass.